little pearl? Sleep cooed softly at her. A voice that had no need to go through her ears instead resounded soothingly in the walls of her head. A voice she should be fighting. Pearl! Another voice came. Loud and mad, noisy and tempestuous. This voice broke the walls of her imagination. It invaded the sweetness of her hallucination and cleared the haze of sleep, however, leaving a grave headache on its way out. Pearl woke to find herself still at work, the café nearly empty. As a result of the acute exquisiteness of her workplace, the café was never in full swing until the night time. Thankfully, Pearl was not on night shift today. This also did not mean that she was completely free and devoid of any strenuous task. The major difficulty with working the daytime shift was having to clean up the mess from last night and having to prepare the place for the next night. Can you hear me? Are you deaf? The veins on her boss's head began to throb uncontrollably. She had forgotten he was talking. Do you hear me? Yes, I do, she said. She dared not ask him to repeat himself, regardless of how polite she might want to sound. He would mistake it for arrogance. This was not Pearl's first time being called out and warned on the note of sleeping on the job. Even though she often fell for the temptation, she knew it was a terrible attitude. How I wish I did not have to work at night as well, she thought to herself, as she reminisced about the many side jobs she had to sit hours on end and do with her younger brother Kevin last night. Two hours of sleep was an unhealthy routine Pearl had gotten used to, but it was all it took for them to pay the bills back at home so as stressful it might look to be, it was necessary. The boss walked back into his office muttering curses towards Pearl underneath his breath. Pearl could have sworn that she heard one or two curse words targeted towards her ethnicity. Once she heard the door of his office slam shut, she turned to her co-worker. Vicky? He said you should go over and scrub the toilets. You know you are on duty today. Check the roster. Pearl thanked Vicky and turned towards the rear of the cafe. Also, one last thing. You do know you are giving the cafe a bad reputation by sleeping on duty. Sorry, it's because of my... Work? Vicky cut in. I'd love to hear it, but guess what? Pearl muttered with her head bowed. She knew that a mean response was on its way. What? You aren't the only one with problems. So, for your own good, don't mess the boss's business up. Vicky spat rudely. Yeah, sure. Pearl shook her heed and exited the counter. It took her some time to walk from one end to the other. Partiel blame goes to her pace, but even more so was the sheer size of the counter. It took 15 servers to conveniently mount it and run it effectively when the place was at full swing and even more during special occasions. Pearl walked slowly towards the toilet. The pungent odour that emitted from behind the closed doors was enough discouragement to force her to quit her job. But what was she to do? She needed the job and the money, and this toilet could use some decent cleansing. As she got about her job, Pearl did not need to remind herself as she did it that this was her least enjoyable part of the job. Lately, with her boss making more complaints about sleeping on the job, her name on the toilet cleaning roster had increased too. Two hours of scrubbing, rinsing, wetting and drying was what it took to get the toilet clean and ready to be used. This night, Pearl knew, a stupid drunk couple would think it's a good idea to sneak in here and attempt copulation then. A gluttonous teenager would eat his fill and force more food into his stomach and retreat here when he needed to throw up. There would also be people using the toilet without flushing. People who would throw rubbish and clog the toilet with toilet paper. There were also going to be those who would leave the tap open and flood the floor. 
all these and many more who could care less about the work of the person cleaning all of it. It was 6.40pm by the time Pearl was done with all her tasks. She planted a slight knock on the office door of the boss and announced that she was clocking off. He responded as he always did to her, with a grunt and a curse. She was already used to it, so it didn't bother her. She left through the rear door in an attempt to avoid contact with Vicky or any of the other workers coming in for the night shift. The route back home was not a pleasant one, especially at night. She ought to take the bus, Pearl thought, but that would mean her not saving for her lunch tomorrow. She began her walk home, but the weariness in her legs did not let her. She cursed under her breath as she went back to the bus station. Lost in thought, five minutes flew by in a second, and the bus came sooner than expected. Pearl climbed in gracefully. As she passed the city, Pearl's mind merged with the scenery that reminded of her childhood dreams and nostalgic fantasies about city life and the big aspirations that she once had as a kid. Can she ever make it out, she wondered. How was it? A middle-aged woman sat across the table as she watched Pearl nibble on her tasteless pap for dinner. The house was tiny, the kitchen and living room crammed into a single space with a slender staircase that led to up to two bedrooms. Pearl's mum waited intently on her daughter's reply. When Pearl noticed, she sighed. I almost slept off at work, she responded. And your boss, her mum asked. My boss called me names. Pearl recollected his insults. Why did it hurt her now and not then? Oh my, I'm sorry. Pearl's mum stood from the table and moved to the sink to attend to the dishes. A single look around and Pearl could tell that she and her mum were the only ones at home. Not very surprising because their irresponsible older brother Joshua never came around to help out. Where's Kevin? Pearl asked. Kevin was her younger brother. He played football for one of the city's clubs. They were all the way in the 8th division, so he did not earn much, and anything he earned, he gave for household use. Daytime a footballer, nighttime a freelancer, not so much different from the life she lived as well. Speak of the devil, her mum responded. The door creaked open slowly, and Kevin walked in. His captain's band was still on his left bicep, while his keeper gloves clutched under his armpit. He dropped a wrapped package on the table, and with his mud-stained jersey, Kevin dragged his feet up to his room and closed the door behind him gently, without uttering a word, to either of them. Pearl and her mum shared a stare. The countenance on his face told the story of what had happened. His team had lost their promotion game, so it would be another 12 months before hopes of increased wages could be spoken about. Pearl's mum took the package and opened it. It was a few bills of cash. Not enough, but not too bad either. She nudged her head towards the room, and Pearl got the message. The staircase creaked as she climbed to the top. Some days, Pearl imagined that it would crumble under their weight. She just wished the day it happened. It would not be her mum who experienced it. Kevin was out of the shower and dressed in fresh clothes when Pearl got to their room. He was on the bed with his laptop in hand. Pearl sat beside him. You won't find relief in the laptop, she told him. I'd find money there, he responded, his voice shaky from the emotions of failure. How bad was it? Five nil. I'm sorry, Pearl looked at her brother. He turned to her. How was work? Don't start, please. Pearl placed a reassuring hand on her brother. You've listened to my wailing about work enough. I barely listen to yours. Talk to me. Kevin had been strong for her many times in the past. It was time for her to be strong for him. I made mistakes in the goal, was all he could manage to say before breaking down. Pearl wrapped his head with her arms and pulled him into a hug. Were you able to get any jobs for tonight? 
she asked, trying to distract his mind from his loss. Yeah, I was. That's cool. Come on, let's get you something to eat so we can get to work, Pearl said. So that was it. The life of Pearl, her routine and her constant struggle. That night, she and Kevin stayed up all night, working on their laptops, with the hopes of making a little extra for the house, since both their incomes combined from their regular job was simply not enough, and their mum fell sick too frequently to have her work as she used to when she was younger. They usually fell asleep on the same bed around 4 a.m., and by 6 a.m., the routine repeated. Today, Pale stood at the notice board in the kitchen reading a notification. It stated that a special guest had lodged into the hotel that their cafe was attached to the night before and now he wanted to host his birthday here at the cafe. Pearl wondered why, but orders were orders. And from the notice board, there was a command that all staff, both daytime and nighttime, would be required to be at their post by 10.30pm when the birthday was going to start. It was anticipated that the influx of customers would be triple. Because of the preparations that were to be done before the evening, Pearl and Vicky were not the only ones called on duty this morning. Pearl avoided any conversation as she got to her task. She started from the very place she despised the most, the toilet. Thankfully, it was not as bad as she had expected it to be. Once the toilet cleaning was done, Pearl moved back to the cafe counter to carry on with her serving work. She did her job in silence until 6 house p.m. On a normal day, she would have been off, but the memo placed today on the notice board suggested otherwise. She had to stay till the end. Settling behind the counter on her seat, Pearl flipped through a book she had brought along in silence. She thought of her family as she scrolled through the pages, looking at the words but never truly reading them. Her mind was with her family, how she wished she could change the way things were. Earth to Pearl, came a calm male voice to her. She placed down the book and looked up. Hi, Mike. Mike stood above the counter, peering down at her. He was a less than imposing man, with a flood of beard around his jaw, that did a lot to enhance his facial appearance. Let's get to decoration, shall we? Before the boss comes after you again. Mike said. Yeah, of course. Pearl climbed to her feet. It ached a bit, making her wonder just how long she had spaced out. Mike held her shoulders as she rocked slightly. She smiled at him. He was the only one who treated her with kindness, her only friend at work. But unfortunately, they did not often meet at work. This was as a result of the way the roster was usually scheduled. Together, Pearl and Mike commenced the decoration. That book you were reading, what's it about? Mike asked. Love. For someone who has never found love, you do read a lot about it, he teased. I have found love, Pearl protested. Spare me the details. Is that Goldilocks again? Mike teased and laughed. Pearl at the tender age of nine, found herself captivated by a boy who seemed to have stepped out of a fairy tale, with his waves of blonde hair that earned him the nickname Goldilocks in her mind. This encounter took place in a hotel lobby, gleaming with the polish of elegance and service, where Pearl's father diligently worked as a janitor. The boy's arrival with his family was nothing short of a spectacle marked by an air of importance that the hotel staff seemed to recognise immediately, fussing over them with a deference that was hard to miss. Pearl's young heart fluttered in a way it never had before upon laying eyes on Goldilocks. His angelic features seemed to cast a spell on her, leaving her both enchanted and shy. Later that day, as his family dined in the hotel's cafeteria, Pearl found herself stealing glances at him from a distance, her curiosity piqued yet restrained by a bashful reluctance to approach. She yearned to strike up a conversation, to bridge the gap between them, but her feet remained rooted in place, 
held back by an invisible force of shyness and circumstance. Their eventual meeting, however, would come about through unforeseen means, far removed from the scenarios Pearl had played out in her mind. The following day unfolded under the bright sun by the hotel pool, where laughter and splashes painted a vibrant scene of carefree joy. While the other children frolicked with their colourful floats, buoyed by their innocence and the safety these aids provided, Pearl remained on the sidelines. She didn't possess such luxuries, but she found solace in the water, embracing it with a confidence and grace that belied her young age. Swimming was second nature to her, a skill she wielded with the ease of a seasoned swimmer, diving headfirst into the cool embrace of the pool without a moment's hesitation. It was in this setting, amidst the laughter and the light-hearted splashes, that Pearl's and Goldilocks' paths would finally cross, in a manner as unexpected as it was fateful, weaving a new thread into the tapestry of Pearl's childhood memories. Pearl was no stranger to bending the rules, especially when it came to her secret thrill of diving off the pool's edge, an act strictly forbidden and one that could easily land her in trouble. She was usually meticulous, scouting for the lifeguard's presence to avoid his watchful eyes and the inevitable scolding that would follow, which would surely reach her father's ears. On this particular day, she executed her routine with precision, ensuring the coast was clear before launching herself into the welcoming waters below. As she glided underwater with a sense of freedom and joy, her adventure took a sudden, serious turn. There, amidst the distorted tranquility below the surface, was Goldilocks, struggling frantically to stay afloat, his movements erratic and filled with panic. The sight pierced through Pearl's carefree spirit, and she surfaced quickly, scanning for the lifeguard, only to find him absent from his post. Driven by a visceral understanding of the terror that drowning brings, Pearl didn't hesitate. She plunged back into the depths, her resolve firm, and made her way to the floundering boy. With a practiced ease, she wrapped her arm around his chest and kicked fiercely towards safety. Her timely intervention brought them both to the edge, where she managed to heave Goldilocks out of the water's perilous grasp. The aftermath was a blur of activity as lifeguards and hotel staff converged on the scene, attending to the coughing and spluttering boy, who was soon whisked away by his distraught parents to seek medical attention. That incident etched Goldilocks into Pearl's memory an indelible mark of a fleeting connection that held a mixture of bravery, fear, and an unspoken bond. Pearl had once confided this tale to Mike, who had since taken to playfully ribbing her about her lingering attachment to the memory of Goldilocks. Get over him already, he jest, snapping Pearl back to the present with a mix of annoyance and nostalgia. Mike's teasing was relentless, often suggesting that Pearl's daydreams, even when she was absorbed in a book, were filled with visions of her childhood hero. Despite her irritation with Mike's teasing, Pearl couldn't deny a kernel of truth in his words. The memory of Goldilocks, of that intense moment of connection and rescue, had indeed carved out a special niche in her heart. It was more than just a childhood crush. In her quieter moments, Pearl would find herself drifting back to that day, allowing herself the luxury of wondering about the boy with the golden hair, where life had taken him, and whether he ever thought of the girl who had once saved him from the depths. Are you okay? Mike asked, as he gathered the leftovers from the decoration. I am, she replied, in a tone that showed that she was not. Pearl was planning in her head, a way to skip the birthday party. The birthday party was long and stressful. For the most part of it, Pearl was able to hide in the toilet. But it all became complicated when something unusual happened. Pearl was busy clearing tables when her manager called her to the back of the kitchen, away from the hustle of clinking dishes and chattering customers. Listen, Pearl, the manager began, 
his voice laced with a hint of excitement and urgency. I want us to make it special for Raiden. Pearl furrowed her brows, a knot forming in her stomach. What do you mean by special? she asked cautiously. The manager's eyes sparkled with a mix of mischief and determination. I need you to bring out a cake and lead a birthday song for him. It'll be a nice surprise, and I'm sure he'll appreciate it. Pearl felt her heart sink. Singing in front of everyone was her least favourite thing. Was this your idea? she questioned, hoping there was still a way out. Shrugging nonchalantly, the manager replied, Just do as you're told, Pearl. It's good for the cafe, and it'll be good for your tips too. She attempted to reason with him, her voice barely above a whisper. Can't someone else do it? I'm really not comfortable with this kind of thing. Her words seemed to evaporate before they could even reach the manager's ears. Pearl, you need to be smiling and engaging with the guests. That's part of your job. Feeling cornered, Pearl's voice finally found some strength. I'm sorry, but I can't do this. It's not what I signed up for when I took this job. The manager's expression turned cold, his patience wearing thin. When did you get so bold, Pearl? He asked, his tone now edged with a threat. Pearl stood there, the weight of yet another unreasonable demand pressing down on her shoulders, her boss's face red with the all-too-familiar blend of anger and impatience. Pearl? If you don't sing happy birthday to Mr. Ballock right now, consider this your last day, he barked, his threat slicing through the tense air. Worn down by the ceaseless stream of threats and the endless dance of appeasement, Pearl felt the fight drain out of her. Your threats don't scare me anymore. I'm more than just your puppet. I've had enough, Pearl declared, her voice steady despite the turmoil inside her. Without another word, she removed her apron, the fabric whispering through the air before it hit the manager's chest. The café, with its clinking dishes and muffled conversations, faded into the background as Pearl walked out, leaving behind the stunned silence of her manager. Ryden Balak woke up in the morning with a tearing pang in his skull. A dull, throbbing sensation filled the four walls of his head just on the inside of his skull, around his brain. It was as if a loud drum had been played inside of it the night before, and what he felt now was the aftermath of its resonating energy. The events of last night began to materialise little by little in his memory. He shut them up for a short while. Now was not the time to recollect his night not after all the emptiness he was feeling in his head. Raiden rose from his bed, but the sheer weight of his head forced him back to bed. So much for being light-headed, Raiden thought to himself. He stretched and reached for a bottle on the nightstand. He was surprised he even remembered it was there. He popped it open and downed what was left of the content in as little as ten swallows before forcing himself up from his bed. He stumbled again and slipped on his jacket, crashing to the floor. Ryden let out a slow groan. It was then he realised just how far wasted he was. He needed coffee, not alcohol, Ryden realised. Ryden clambered into the bathroom to freshen up. He had quite a few things on his hand today, and there was a particular one of great importance. A runaway client by the name of Larry pulled a smart one on him the week before, and it was not until the last three days before his media team were able to pinpoint his location. In the last three days in this city, he had frequented the cafe where he celebrated his birthday the night before. One thing he loved the most was their morning coffee. It was strong and left a light aftertaste. Ryden felt like he needed it this morning more than he had ever needed it. He walked into the cafe and took his usual seat at the edge by the right. He waved a server over and requested his usual coffee. Opposite him on his table sat his personal assistant, Tony. The coffee came back shortly after, however, 
a little bit quicker than he was used to. But there was a problem. The coffee did not taste the same. This one, though not bad in and of itself, had a naked taste to it when in comparison to the one he was used to. Raiden looked up at the waiter. What's wrong with your coffee this morning? Did you drink so much last night you forgot how to do it? The server looked down at her shoe, feeling intimidated. No, sir. Sorry, sir. Let me fix it. Can you tell me what's wrong with it, please? It's lacking. Uh, he turned to Tony and asked, What's the word? Maybe sugar? Tony suggested. They went back and forth on this matter, testing coffees and suggesting missing ingredients. Once, Tony even suggested salt, but all attempts couldn't bring the exact flavour Ryden craved. Eventually, Ryden got tired and asked, What's your name? Vicky, the server replied. Vicky, may I see the management? Raiden asked. Yes, sir. A minute later, Raiden was in Gary's office, the manager of the cafe. How may I help you, sir? Gary asked. I am drunk, Raiden said plainly. Gary furrowed his brow in confusion. Okay? Hangover from last night, Raiden continued. I cannot help but notice that your coffee tastes a tiny bit different today. I see. You are used to Pearl's coffee, Gary replied. It's the girl who refused to sing for you. She's no longer employed here. Gary stood up and walked over to his shelf and fiddled around with some files. So, nobody knows how to make coffee now, Raiden asked. Gary remained silent. You shouldn't have let her go then, man, Raiden said. She was unproductive, Gary said. She made good coffee, though. She slept on the job too often. Tell me, how much do you pay these people anyway? Gary remained silent. Give them a break. Raiden rose to his feet, however, this time more carefully. What is her name? He asked. Pearl. Pearl who? Pearl Alcorta. Raiden, who was making his way to the door, froze. He placed a hand on the side of his hurting head, then walked out silently. Pearl Alcorta, Raiden whispered silently in his moving car. What's that? Tony, who was riding shotgun, asked. Nothing. As he drove, the last name Alcorta kept resonating in his head. He felt like he had heard it before. He forced his brain to give him a burst of memory, but nothing came, not even as much as a spark. But somehow, he knew that there was something somewhere in his head that at the right time and with the right condition, that name would ignite a mirage of memory. The grand city began to dwindle as Raiden followed his car's GPS to the address that his security team had identified as the abode of Larry, the con man who had stolen a watch from his company. The watch was nothing special in its component. No diamond, no gold, nothing. But it had a significant value. It was a family heirloom, the watch worn by his grandfather during World War II. So naturally, losing it like that was not meant to be. Orotund commercial buildings of large manufacturers, banks and company offices slowly turned to modest shacks of salons and bars. The street vegetation lost its lush green and well-trimmed edges, replaced by random trees and barbed wire fences. Trash bags looked as if they had not been attended to for years. Cats and dogs wore no leash, neither any collars nor name tags. This was the lesser part of the city, Raiden realised. The part where the unfortunate or the financially unstable were sent to live. Trapped in a cycle of poverty, these people had very little chance of making it out of here. They worked for long hours to garner a pay that was barely enough to feed themselves. These people could hardly do any business or test the waters of innovation. They did not have the time. 
How could they, when most of their time was focused on working to eat? If only they had the time to innovate, to educate themselves. Then they would know, and then we'd lose our place. These thoughts, and many more, ran through Ryden's head as he made his drive through the ghetto. We are here, Tony said, as they arrived at the address where Larry's phone last pinged. It was a small house, soiled, foul and pestiferous looking from the outside, and not unlike the rest around it. How it still stood remained a wonder. I'll go in, Ryden unclipped his seatbelt. I'll go with you, Tony announced. Very nice of you, but I feel like I should do this alone. Ryden alighted from the car and headed over to the door. Two knocks were enough to have the keyhole clicking open. Hi, greeted a woman with a slight hunch. Hi, Ryden had expected something different. I came in search of Larry. Oh, I'm sorry, we don't have any Larry here, the woman said with a smile that looked honest. He told me this was his address, Ryden lied. Did he now? Why don't you come on in? Maybe we can figure out who this Larry guy is. The woman led him in. Have a seat. She motioned to the kitchen counter. He obeyed. The house was smaller on the inside than it looked from the outside. Despite its small size, they had been creatively able to squeeze the living room into the kitchen in a tight, cramped space. On the other side of the house, there was a staircase that led somewhere. Raiden toyed with the idea of running off while the woman had her back turned but that idea flew out the window when he considered all the possibilities that could play out if things went wrong. Maybe Larry was up there after all, waiting with a weapon in hand. He had better not take her hospitality for granted. Another weird thought came to his head. What if she was Larry? The woman turned to him. Coffee or tea or something stronger? I'd take coffee, he said without thinking. He had taken a lot of stronger stuff the previous night, but had been deprived of a decent cup of coffee. So coffee was his best option. The woman went on preparing the coffee while she conversed with him. So who is this Larry guy? Honestly, I am yet to find out myself. What did he do? Ryden stopped for a minute to think. Was it safe to tell her? What if she had something to do with it? Nothing. A mere breakdown in business communication. He tried to frame it differently, but still maintain the meaning. That's sad. I'll let my children know and see if any of them knows Larry. The woman brought the coffee before him. How many have you got? Ryden asked. Three? What about your husband? A flash of sadness flicked through her eyes. In an instant, as fast as it had appeared, it disappeared. He's at a better place now. I'm sorry about that. For the first time since coming here, Ryden felt something genuine towards the people living here. A woman with three children and no husband struggling in a place like this was no joke. Was he a good man? Ryden asked. He felt obliged to say something comforting to the woman more than a simple apology. But he did not know what to say, so perhaps a simple question would start a good conversation. He was the sweetest man you'll ever meet, son, the woman started. He was charming as a man, hard-working, caring as a father and a husband, so sad he had to leave us very soon. The woman took a seat opposite him. Son, are you married? No, not yet. Here's something I'd like to tell you. She lowered her voice, and Raiden found himself leaning in to listen. Never let your business overtake your family, because when you die, your business will pass like an unmarried bride to the next man, but your family can never. The words sunk deep into Raiden's soul. He was not married, so this advice did not immediately connect to him but it made him think again of all the things he had seen earlier when he was driving past the suburbs. 
Ryden took a sip and paused. He looked up at the woman. She was sitting down and staring outside. No way, he whispered aloud. This is it. How is this possible? It was the coffee he was referring to. This was the coffee he had been looking for. It had the same strong taste and light aftertaste. In his joy of finding a decent coffee, he downed it right away. He even forgot he was searching for the con man. Having chatted with the woman and not getting any leads on the Larry guy, Raiden left and went back to his office. Job hunting was draining, even more intense and back-breaking than actual hunting. Not that Pearl had ever hunted before, but at least hunting had to do with killing animals, which meant reaping your reward on a daily basis depending on how good you hunted. In job hunting, the only killing that was happening was the one happening to you. The interviews, the setbacks, the on-the-spot rejections and the abundance of cliché words used in a particular response. Just today, Pearl could count the many will get back to you and we are not hiring at the moment. That was the good part. The bad part was when she had to meet and endure rude people. One even asked why a beautiful damsel was searching for meagre jobs when she could easily spread her legs and earn a fortune. This comment stabbed Pearl's heart, and she called off her job hunting for the day. It was evening when she was returning back home. She kicked stones absent-mindedly as she walked, all her attention on her little distracting task. She failed to notice when Kevin fell in step with her. He observed her for a moment as they walked together. Pearl, still oblivious of Kevin's presence, kicked the stone ahead. You have to hit it harder, Pearl, Kevin announced his presence. Pearl flinched and jumped back. When she saw that it was Kevin, she relaxed and grinned. What's wrong? Kevin asked, noticing her mood. You didn't find anything? Nope, she mumbled. Pearl and Kevin finally got home after their long walk. Home was just as it used to be, tiny but comfy, maybe only comfy because of the realisation that that was home. Their mother was sitting on the couch listening to the radio when they walked in. She barely recognised their presence not until they walked past her. Oh, you guys are home, she called after them. Pearl looked down then to the side, avoiding eye contact with her mum. Her brother gave her a light tap on the shoulder. The next day came in a minute. As her manner was, Pearl stepped outside to get some fresh air. It was something she loved the most about the day. Pearl stood in the open, allowing the morning breeze whoosh through all her senses. Her only wish now was that she found a good job. She retreated back into the house to begin her morning chores and prepare breakfast. She made an omelette and coffee. After a few minutes, Kevin stumbled down from their room to join her. Their mum was, as usual, on the couch listening to her radio. Oftentimes, Kevin and Pearl would promise themselves to save up funds to get her a television, but in every instance, they had to dig deep into the funds to get essentials for the home. The front door crashed open loudly and in came a face they had not seen in weeks. A face that constantly annoyed Pearl. One that reminded her of just how much work and burden she and Kevin had to bear because he was too lazy and careless to bear it with them. It was Joshua, the youngest brother. He barely came home. And when he did, it was always when he had run out of cash or when he was in danger. Pearl wondered what it was now. Hey, Joshua! What the heck, man? Kevin blocked his path. You run off for a week and just pop back in? You think that's okay? Get out of my way, Kevin. He shoved Kevin aside and headed upstairs. Pearl was angry. She had struggled for so long and now she had lost her job. All this would not have been very difficult if Joshua would just step up to responsibility. She was not having it today. He'd either stay and work or pack his things and never come back. Pearl followed him shortly into their room. 
What is wrong with you? She barked at him. Don't raise your voice at me! He rose to his full height. Intimidating as he was, the forge of despair had hardened Pearl's heart, sharpening her guts to its sharpest. I'll raise my voice how I deem it fit, and to whoever. Joshua looked down at her and cracked a smile. He went back to frisking through his belongings. Joshua, listen to me! Pearl roared, a roar that sounded more like a tiny bark than an actual roar, courtesy of her feminine voice. I'm listening, Joshua replied in a tune that shows he was deaf to whatever she was going to say. A screech came from outside. Joshua rushed to the window to take a look. Jesus, he exclaimed. Pearl rushed in after him to have a look. Parked outside their house was a black sedan. The door swung open and a man in a black suit rushed out. Panic struck Pearl's heart and it skipped two beats. She turned to Joshua but found herself alone in the room. A bang, voices, and another bang was heard from below. Without hesitation, Pearl rushed downstairs. On arrival, she was met with a scene that ignited a fire in her she had no idea she possessed. The man in black suit had Kevin pinned below him on the counter. His forearm was pressed against his neck and his head was losing colour. Where's he going? The man in black rasped deep in the ear of the pinned boy. Pearl looked around to see Joshua through the window, running off. Get off him! This time, her voice came out as a thunderous roar. Masculine and bold, menacing and daring. She lounged at the man and connected her fist squarely on his head. He stumbled back and Kevin dropped to the ground, breathing heavily. Pearl shielded Kevin with her body. She knew she would not stand a chance against a man who was able to pin Kevin, but she had to try anyway. The man, in his fury, took two brisk steps towards Pearl, but stopped the instance with both of their eyes connected. Pearl, he whispered. Tears filled Pearl's eyes. You, she screamed, you get me fired and now you want to kill my brother. Pearl couldn't control it and the tears flowed out. No, wait, I'm sorry, I can explain. I was drunk. He reached down to touch her shoulders, but she flared up and scratched his arm. She turned back to Kevin. She cuddled his head in her tears. Get out, please. Pearl's mum, who had been sleeping the whole time, got out of her bed, her face in shock. She stood there in silence looking around and then said, if you come to my house to make a mess, leave now before I call the police. If you have good intentions, stay. Tara lived in a place where gunshots and fights were common, but she believed in solving problems without violence. She thought the man in the suit was connected to her son Joshua, and she wanted to find out more. Breakfast was tense and silent. In her life, Pearl could not recall a day she had eaten in such silence before. The man in black, who had introduced himself as Raiden earlier, barely touched the food served to him. He nibbled slowly but mostly drank his coffee. Kevin gave him death stares. Why are we silent? Breakfast tables aren't supposed to be silent? Tara asked with her usual wrinkly smile. Raiden stirred uncomfortably in his seat. He scratched his head and cleared his throat. Thank you for letting me speak. What do you want? Pearl asked. Who sent you? To take my job and my brother away from me. Raiden bowed his head in what looked like shame. He remained silent for a while before maintaining his composure. I'm not here for anything. I'm just here for my watch. Raiden went on to explain how he had found the company that fixed old watches and that someone under the name Larry was supposed to fix it and return it to him. Joshua did as told and sent the watch, but soon after, the person he was talking to went silent and the website vanished. It turned out to be a scam and Joshua was actually using a fake name, Larry. When Raiden was done telling his story, 
it was the Alcorta's turn to bow all their heads in shame. We are so sorry for the troubles we have put you in, Mr. Raiden, Pearl's mother pleaded. Pearl knew there was no way they could pay that money if legal actions were to be taken against them. We promise we'll have him return the watch or pay you back. I really hope I get the watch back. It's a family relic and it has to be retrieved. Raiden stood to his feet. He turned to Pearl and offered her a hand. She slapped it off. Her mum frowned at her rudeness. What's the matter, Pearl? Tara asked, puzzled. It looks like you two have met before. Yes, we have. He's the one I wouldn't sing happy birthday for, and then I lost my job because of it, Pearl explained, looking serious. Ryden moved over to Kevin and outstretched his hand for a handshake. As Kevin rose to his feet, Pearl held on to his shoulders. With a reassuring look, Kevin shrugged himself free from her grasp and clapped Ryden's hand. They bumped their shoulders into each other in a half hug, and Kevin whispered something into Ryden's ear, which made him laugh. Ryden left. He seems like a nice young man, Tara said as soon as Ryden left. He's got a cool car. Kevin said as he got to clearing the table. But he took Pearl's job. We can't forgive that. I hate these rich kids, Pearl added. The old woman gave her two children a look that shut them up immediately. Did I raise you kids to hold grudges? If anyone has lost anything, it's him. And it's our fault he lost that watch. You might say it's Joshua's fault, but Joshua's one of us. Pearl and Kevin remained silent, slowly starting to see the sense in what their mother had just said. The next day, Ryden showed up again to their home. This time, Pearl's mum was asleep in the room, leaving only Pearl at home as Kevin was at work. He knocked softly, and Pearl answered the door. He seemed hesitant at first to come in, but after Pearl assured him that it was fine, he came in. What brings you here? Pearl chose the way she asked carefully to avoid sounding rude. I actually came to see you, if that's okay. Of course, why not? Have a seat. Pearl stepped into the kitchen while Ryden sat on the couch. Shortly after, she came back with her tail between her legs. Ryden understood what it meant. I can't really offer you anything. We are having a shortage of stuff, so... Sorry. She handled it okay, he thought. That's cool. Silly of me not to bring you guys something as well. We can just talk. Pearl sat beside him on the couch. He was not smelling of alcohol or any drugs she was familiar with, so perhaps his drunkenness was a one-time occasion. His perfume filled her nose with an aura that made him look bigger and stronger than he actually was. I'm sorry my brother hasn't come back since, Pearl pleaded. You don't need to apologize. It's not your fault he turned out that way. How's job hunting? Worse than hunting in the jungle? They both laughed. I can imagine. They both sat in silence for a while. Ryden spoke. I didn't mean for your boss to fire you. I think back to the way I behaved that night every day and I regret it. I don't even remember asking for a birthday song. I guess your boss wanted to pull a dollar out of me. Don't let the memory hunt you. It's okay. I was going to leave the place sooner or later anyway, Pearl said. Why is that? Raiden asked. The guy is an a-hole, calling me names all the time. Ryden's eyebrows made an arch. He was unsure on how to console her. I'm sorry, Pearl, Ryden said. At that moment, he dreamed of getting Gary to apologize to her. They spent the rest of the morning talking and even taking a walk outside. Pearl showed Raiden around, telling him stories of how they first came to live in a place like this. We didn't always live like this, you know, she told him. Really? What happened? Ryden asked. Yeah. My dad used to work. 
he had quite a decent job until he got sick. We tried everything we could to save him. It got so bad he was put on life support. He told us at one point to get him off life support, but we couldn't bring ourselves to do it. So, we spent all our money keeping him alive. He made a full recovery but died of complications from the drugs he was given during the treatment process. Then we moved all the way down here when we discovered there was nothing for us anymore uptown. Ever since mom got diagnosed with her mental disorder, she couldn't keep a job. Her mood swings got out of hand and we had to take care of her at home. But she's way better now. Me and Kevin work hard to cover her meds and keep the food on the table for everyone. In reality, Pearl was the one working hard for everyone. Kevin did pitch in now and then, but Pearl preferred he focus on his studies and football. She saw it as one of the few ways he could make a better life for himself. Pearl finished her story with a sad smile. Raiden was silent for a long time. More than once he opened his mouth to say something, but the words failed to come out. Trying to find the right words? Pearl asked with a chuckle. I... eh... Uh, yeah. It's okay. Sometimes we get so entrenched into saying the right things or not saying the wrong things that sometimes we say nothing at all. You remind me of someone, he said. I'm not going to lie but you remind me of someone too. They stopped in the street, staring at each other for what they thought was a second, but in reality was at least ten. It was odd for her. His company felt so comforting that it sparked a strange new feeling in her heart. When Pearl's hand accidentally touched his, Ryden felt his heart skip a beat. However, the brief moment was interrupted by the beeping of Ryden's watch. Pearl giggled and asked, What's that? Sorry, it's work. Ryden turned the alarm off. I need to get going. You're lucky you have a job. It must also pay well, Pearl said. Oh, I don't actually earn any money. I work for my dad, doing things I'm not fond of. I'm just biding my time until I turn 25. That's when I plan to leave his business and start my own thing. That was our agreement. Raiden spun around and hurried back to his car. But after a few steps, he stopped suddenly, returned, and gently kissed Pearl on the cheek. Pearl's eyes widened in surprise. Her cheeks turned bright red and she stood there speechless, completely taken aback. From that day on, Raiden's visit became a regular occurrence. Even after the retrieval of the watch from the man who Joshua had sold it to, he still turned up so often that Kevin noticed a slight shift in Pearl's behavior on days he did not show up. They started dating and going out. From amusement parks to dates at restaurants to driving to the mountains overlooking the city for a good view, it felt like they had known each other for a long time but they could never tell where it was that they had met before. That evening, they both sat on the grass atop a mountain and watched as night dusked on the city. It was a sight to see, and one Pearl had not been able to see ever since she was a kid. I've seen this before, Pearl reminisced, her voice taking on a nostalgic tone. Really? Tell me more, Ryden urged intrigued by her sudden shift. Pearl hesitated, a playful smile tugging at her lips. It's not all that interesting. You might find it dull. I doubt that, Ryden countered gently. It's less of the tale and more of the teller. Encouraged, Pearl allowed herself a small smile, her gaze drifting away. She felt a warm flush spread across her cheeks, unsure if it was the setting sun or her emotions painting them a deeper shade of red. It's a memory from my childhood, she started, her voice soft. My dad took us, me and my siblings, to this very spot. It was the most breathtaking view I'd ever seen, even to this day. But Kevin, my brother, he couldn't stand it. She chuckled at the memory, 
the sound light and carefree. Ryden couldn't help but tease. Liar. I can't imagine there's anything you like that Kevin doesn't. Pearl burst into laughter, shaking her head. You'd be surprised. We couldn't stand each other as kids. He was such a pest. So what changed? Ryden probed, genuinely curious about the dynamics between Pearl and her brother. With a reflective sigh, Pearl shared. Life, I guess. Responsibilities have a way of bringing people together, forging bonds you never expected. Despite everything, it seems we have a lot to be thankful for, the good and the bad. What about Joshua? Raiden asked. You never talk about him. Raiden's question hung in the air for a brief moment, giving Pearl time to collect her thoughts. She exhaled deeply before speaking, her voice tinged with a mixture of fondness and concern. Joshua. He was always the one Dad had a soft spot for. They were inseparable. After Dad died, it's like Joshua lost his way. He was old enough to grasp that Dad wasn't coming back, and it changed him. He became withdrawn, and eventually we just lost communication. But he's still my brother, and I love him. I'm holding on to hope that he'll find his footing soon. Raiden offered a warm, encouraging smile in response. You're doing an incredible job looking out for your brothers, Pearl. Joshua might not grasp everything now, but with time and your guidance, he'll come around. I was a bit of a late bloomer myself, but look at me now. Just keep being there for him. The discussion went on, deep and deeper, that they had nearly lost track of time. Finally, they called it quits and decided to go home after three thunder strikes and a drizzle. The raised windows and the outpour of rain outside seemed to impose on the atmosphere in the car. They were a few miles away from the outskirts of the city, and the streets were desolate of cars or any side tractions. The quiet inside the car, filled only by the rhythmic sound of wipers and the hush of air against the windshield, lulled Pearl towards sleep. She gazed out into the rain-soaked darkness, her eyes heavy, when suddenly a startling flash appeared. It took a moment for her to recognise it as a face, and she screamed in alarm. Stop! The shout came just as a man leaped from the roadside. Ryden's reactions were swift, bringing the car to a jarring halt. In the dim light and pouring rain, the man's features were indistinct, but his urgent voice cut through the storm. Help! he pleaded. There's a girl! She's clinging to a twig in the water. The current's too strong for her. Without hesitation, Pearl and Ryden sprang from the car, following the stranger into the night. They came upon a chilling scene. A car had crashed into a fence, its wrecked body teetering on the edge of a cliff. The driver, a young girl, had been thrown from the vehicle and was now desperately holding onto a slender tree branch over the rushing water. Her situation was precarious, half submerged in the torrent below, the branch threatening to snap at any moment. In this remote stretch, their cell phones were useless, no signal to call for help. Time was of the essence, and they knew they had to act fast to save the girl from the perilous grip of the river. The only assistance came from an elderly man who, limited by his age, could offer nothing more than a rope for their rescue attempt. He handed it to Ryden, who quickly secured it around his waist, the other end tied firmly to a sturdy metal fence. With no time to lose, Ryden plunged into the swollen river, allowing the surging water to carry him toward the girl. Pearl, her heart racing, watched anxiously, her fingers pressed to her lips in worry. She instructed the elderly man to signal for help from any passing vehicles, hoping for additional assistance. Ryden reached the girl and gripped her firmly, beginning the precarious journey back to safety. Just as they neared the bank, disaster struck. The rope unexpectedly came loose. 
In a split-second decision, Raiden propelled the girl towards the shore, ensuring her safety before the relentless current swept him away. Pearl's scream pierced the stormy night as she raced along the bank, desperate to keep Raiden in sight. Miraculously, Raiden managed to cling to a rock, battling the force of the water that threatened to overwhelm him. Pearl, driven by a surge of adrenaline, grabbed a long branch and edged closer to the water. Stretching as far as she could, she reached out to Raiden. Their hands clasped, but Pearl's strength alone wasn't enough. Just then, she felt a surprising pull from behind. It was the elderly man, lending his strength to the rescue effort. Together, with a combined force born of desperation and Raiden's waning energy, they hauled him from the merciless grip of the river, dragging him to the safety of the shore. The relief was palpable, but so was the realization of how close they had come to tragedy. As Raiden lay there, his palms raw with scrapes, he gasped for breath, looking up into the face of his rescuer. In that moment, something profound passed between Raiden and Pearl, as if time itself had slowed down, wrapping them in an intimate spell. Pearl's mind was suddenly awash with vivid memories, water fights, laughter, colourful balloons, and the cool embrace of pool water. She was transported back to being eleven, revelling in the simple joys of childhood summers. And now, seeing Raiden up close, she was struck by a realisation. His features, the unique shade of his eyes, the familiarity of his presence, it all clicked. Raiden was the Goldilocks from her past, a nickname born from a cherished memory. Raiden's eyes shimmered with unshed tears as recognition dawned, his voice barely a whisper through the emotional turmoil. It's you, he breathed, disbelief and awe mingling in his tone. You're the girl from the pool, the one who saved me. Tears broke free as the weight of the moment settled upon him, a mix of gratitude and astonishment. You did it again, he said, the words choked by sobs. Pearl, overwhelmed by a whirlwind of emotions, found laughter amidst her tears. After all these years, I've found you again, she exclaimed, the joy in her voice tinged with wonder. Their embrace was more than that of lovers. It was a reunion of souls long separated, now finally reconnected. And when they kissed, it was with a passion ignited by years of unknowing separation, now culminating in a moment of profound rediscovery and connection. As the ambulance drove off into the night, Raiden's hands were carefully tended to by the paramedics. He barely flinched at the sting of the antiseptic, his mind elsewhere, basking in the warmth of the revelation. Sitting side by side, Pearl broke the comfortable silence that had settled between them. I used to wonder what happened to that brave boy from the pool. I never forgot that day, and I hoped maybe one day we'd meet again. I guess the world is smaller than we think. Raiden turned to her, his eyes reflecting a mix of emotions. I can't believe it's you. After we moved, I thought I'd never get the chance to find you again. You were like this. This beacon of courage I remembered whenever I faced something tough. Pearl laughed softly, a sound that made Raiden's heart flutter. A beacon, huh? I was just a kid who loved the water too much to see someone struggle in it. And now you've saved me again, Raiden said, his voice laden with a mixture of gratitude and wonder. Life has a strange way of coming full circle. Yeah, it does, Pearl agreed, her gaze meeting his. And I'm glad it brought me back to you, Goldilocks. Raiden chuckled at the nickname, a vestige of a summer long gone, but never forgotten. I guess I owe you a couple of life debts now, huh? Just being here is enough, Pearl said, her hand finding his. 
we've got a lot of lost time to make up for. As they sat there, hands intertwined, the past and present melded together. A tapestry of memories and moments that led them back to each other, against all odds. Ryden took Pearl home and said that he would return tomorrow. When he came the next day, he wasn't alone. He came with a middle-aged man in a suit. Hey, Pearl, this is my father, Philippe, Ryden said in her ears. They greeted each other, and Pearl invited them all in. But Ryden said that they had booked a table in a restaurant for all of them. He said that his father was inviting them all to dinner. Excited, Pearl ran back to the house. A few minutes later, Pearl, Tara and Kevin were beaming as they sat on the back seats of a limousine. Ryden's father was a slim and serious-looking man with some grey streaks of hair. They all sat at the table in a fancy restaurant. Ryden's dad had taken the trouble to fly all the way from New York to their city when his son informed him that the girl he was dating was the one who had saved his life when he was still a child. What a coincidence, Ryden's father said in amazement. Thank you for having us tonight, Pearl's mum said. The evening had unfolded like a scene from a dream. As they enjoyed their meal, laughter and stories were shared, weaving a tapestry of newfound friendships. It was during this warm exchange that Philip, with a solemn look in his eyes, steered the conversation towards a topic that had weighed heavily on his heart, the incident at the pool. If I lost my son, it would definitely break me, Philip confessed, his voice tinged with the gravity of what could have been a tragedy. The table fell silent, all ears attuned to him. After the incident, I ordered my people to bring in the person who saved my son. They brought in the hotel manager. He continued, a hint of frustration in his tone. He paused, looking directly at Pearl with a mixture of regret and gratitude. He received a substantial amount of money from me, which should have gone to you, Pearl. I apologize for the mix-up. I will make that payment now. The moment Philip produced the check and began to write, an air of disbelief enveloped the table. Pearl's family watched in stunned silence, their eyes wide with shock. Tara was so overwhelmed by the turn of events that she had to ask the waiter for some water, her hand trembling slightly as she took the glass. Pearl, on the other hand, was flooded with an overwhelming sense of gratitude and relief. She could barely hear the conversation over the ringing in her ears, a melody of hope and thanksgiving to God. The light of endless possibilities shone brightly before her, illuminating a path to a better life for her family. The burden of their struggles seemed to lift in that moment, making way for dreams of moving out of their cramped living conditions and finding fulfilling work, or perhaps even starting a business of their own. Overwhelmed by a torrent of emotions, Pearl excused herself from the table, murmuring something about needing a moment. In the solitude of the restroom, she allowed herself to fully embrace the feelings she had been holding back. Tears of joy and relief streamed down her face as she thought about the brighter future that now seemed within reach. She wept for the hardships they had endured, for the dreams she had clung to, and for the unexpected blessing that had been bestowed upon them that night. When she came back, Philip got up and pulled the chair out for her to sit down. Then he went on. Now that you've saved my son in more ways than one, I'd be glad to have you in my company. Ryden mentioned how dedicated you are, Philip said with a smile. Six months later, Pearl sat elegantly, her white gown flowing around her like a cascade of pure light. Across from her, Kevin was the very picture of sophistication in his sharp, well-fitted suit. It had been quite some time since Pearl had seen him dressed with such care, and she couldn't help but admire how dashing he looked. 
Stop staring, weirdo. I don't look as ridiculous as you, Kevin teased, breaking the comfortable silence. Pearl chuckled, her eyes sparkling with amusement. I look beautiful, she retorted with playful pride. You're wearing white. People are going to think you're an angel, Kevin continued, his tone rich with mock seriousness. Pearl couldn't help but laugh at his words. Ha ha ha, very funny. It's called a wedding gown, Kevin. The room echoed with their laughter, a testament to the light-hearted banter that had always characterized their relationship. Indeed, it was Pearl's wedding day. The journey to this moment had been nothing short of miraculous. After receiving a generous check from Philip, her family had moved to a quieter, more peaceful home far from the clamour of their previous life. They had even bought a house for their mother, ensuring she would never have to worry about rent again. Pearl's life had taken a turn for the better in more ways than one. She had secured a job at Ryden's father's company, where she was thriving. Her evenings were spent pursuing further education at college, a testament to her unwavering determination to build a better future. The decision to marry had come after six months of dating Ryden, spurred on by Philip's half-joking, half-serious pleas to see grandchildren before it was too late. It was a joyous culmination of love and new beginnings. So, what's next for you, Kevin? Pearl inquired, her tone tinged with genuine curiosity. Kevin's eyes twinkled with excitement, yet he tried to maintain an air of mystery. Well, I don't want to spoil the surprise just yet. Pearl wasn't having any of it. Come on, spill it, she urged, her voice a mix of excitement and impatience. A proud grin spread across Kevin's face. I got an offer from a club. Pearl's reaction was immediate. She sprang to her feet, her gown swirling around her. How big? she asked her voice a mix of awe and anticipation. Second division, Kevin replied, his smile broadening. Pearl's joy was palpable, even though the technicalities eluded her. I have no idea what that means, she admitted, her voice bubbling with happiness. But it sounds amazing. Kevin's news was like a spark that set off her excitement. It means you can watch me on TV now, he explained, his own excitement mirroring hers. Without a moment's hesitation, Pearl enveloped her brother in a warm, joyful hug, planting a kiss on his cheek. The bond they shared was unbreakable, a source of strength and comfort for both. As for Joshua, Pearl's other brother, he too was on a path of growth and change. Under Ryden's mentorship, he was slowly but surely maturing, much to everyone's surprise. Raiden often joked about never having been outsmarted by a teenager before, yet it was clear he had grown fond of Joshua. With a little encouragement, Joshua had even returned to school, with plans to leverage his unique skills for a brighter future. As Pearl looked around the room, surrounded by the people she loved most, she couldn't help but feel a profound sense of gratitude. This was the happy ending she had always dreamed of for her family. A new beginning, filled with hope, love, and the promise of endless possibilities.